Um, so I'll start this off with just a few words on the idea of the avant-garde, the two books. I somehow feel a little bit like I've been repeating myself insofar as I've given three presentations on the subject, but since it's being recorded, this will be a kind of uh, final statement on the subject. So the idea of the avant-garde, volume one and two, as I've mentioned to you, was conceived in light of the strengths and the weaknesses of the social practice art, which I considered to be, since roughly the 2000s, one of the uh, key developments in contemporary art practices. Um, its weakness, in part, had to do with the emphasis on a kind of social practice effectivity, which is measured in terms of art's effectivity, such like a kind of art as a sort of social work. So the question becomes, in terms of doing social work, in terms of doing amel ameliorative and reparative social work, why should artists be stepping in when formerly we had social services doing that kind of work with people who are professionally trained and who are more responsible and more accountable um, in terms of uh, institutional expertise for exactly those kinds of remedial activities. So why are artists stepping in where the welfare state or something along those lines was hitherto doing an all right uh, uh, servicing of the goods? So in, in a sense, artists are stepping in where the welfare state is foundering. Um, with that in mind, social practice art abandons a little bit the field of uh, cultural production. So it moves away from a more art-defined realm and uses art as a, as Joshua Clover would say, a kind of receptive form for a social, uh, an art in the expanded field. So a kind of practice that has its locus of valuation outside the realm of, the distinct realm of art. And in this sense, I particularly appreciate John's book, Revolutionary Time in the Avant-Garde, for stepping in exactly in that uh, space where there's a lacuna between what, um, in, in the praxeological problem between theory and practice. So John has strengthened the theory aspect of various kinds of avant-garde, radical, or politicized art practices. And that's exactly what the idea of the avant-garde was conceived to do or intended to do, at least as far as a kind of editorial intention is concerned. However, uh, the difference between our John's book, which is a monograph, and this project, is that the, this project was an invitational um, text where people were in, people from different fields, different arts backgrounds, um, different kinds of opinions were invited to to say whatever they had to say about the concept, the idea of the avant-garde and what it means today. So it was an open experimental space where anything could happen technically vis-a-vis -vis the concept, including people who disagree with the concept. So um, in some cases that meant that a person would not want to contribute to the book at all. And it very funnily, for example, an artist that's considered avant-garde like uh, the Yes Men's Andy Bicklebaum, or the filmmaker, um, who's the filmmaker? You have all of his films. No, <laughs> I can't remember his name. It's just uh, escaping me. Anyhow, um, an avant-garde filmmaker uh, said that you know he doesn't have anything to say, or he's never said anything about the avant-garde. Uh, so he didn't know how to contribute to the book. So you get what I refer to not as the prohibition in that case on the avant-garde, but the sort of reluctance of avant-gardists to define themselves as avant-garde for various reasons in ways that are symptomatic of the, if you want to call it that, the objective social conditions in which we can think and discuss the idea of the avant-garde, which is very similar to the social conditions in which we can think and discuss the concept of communism. So the book is, in its title, a uh, reference to Zizek and Duzinas' edited book, the first one, The Idea of Communism, 
and then the second volume, uh, I think it's Zizek only, uh, volume two, and then the third, which is edited by three people um, on the idea of communism. So the idea of the avant-garde is doing something similar, but from a, a kind of cultural theory, cultural practice orientation. So that was, in a way, the goal of the, the first volume was to enhance and buttress the kinds of social practice art that are happening from a, slight, from a theoretical perspective. To not have, as John puts it nicely, an escape of art into politics or vice versa, an escape of politics into art. So to have kind of praxeological relationship between art and theory. Um, so the, the discussion is um, meant to interest every kind of actor within the field of cultural production. It was intended to be uh, produced by artists and intellectuals. I much prefer the term intellectuals than academics or scholars. Uh, intellectuals need not be institutionalized and people who are institutionalized need not be dismissed as academics um, in this kind of institutional critique way of thinking about their practice. In terms of editorial role, I avoided anything that would be construed as the editor as Oedipal figure, the curator as Oedipal figure, that the contributor would be obsessed with understanding, perhaps subverting and mining, or, or trying to somehow um, double, th um, uh, what's the word? Second guess. Um, so I tried to, to avoid that kind of framing. I made the introduction to the first volume as short and as simple as I could, though for the second volume I was encouraged by the peer reviewers to say more so that the book could function more as an intervention in the field. Um, I avoided that for the first book because in a way I want the book to have a lifespan. I want the book to not be simply punctual, something that is of its time, but that it would have some sort of reach. And that's exactly, those are exactly the kinds of practices that interest me. Works that uh, outlive their moment and that are meaningful to us in that sense beyond their uh, initial context. Um, so everyone talks about, for example, the Sex Pistols concerts in Manchester in, the, in 1976. And so those are events that resonate with us today. And those are the kinds of works and artists that interest me in terms of Inv inviting to contribute to the books. Uh, same, same for the artists invited to contribute to the exhibition. Um, so editor as analyst and uh, art as symptom in terms of a Lacanian approach to um, practice and theory that of course is uh, something that I um, trained to think about as a Zizekian scholar. And so working with Lacanian theory is my way of, of, um, of working through, you could say, some, some issues in cultural theory and aesthetic philosophy. Um, so this is a, the sort of theoretical background that I use to approach issues relating to art practice. You have here um, Lacan's four discourses. So these are four different ways that I think about different kinds of art practices related to Lacan's four mathemes, mathematical equations that are defined as the four discourses and that are discussed in his book, The Other Side of Psychoanalysis, his seminar titled The Other Side of Psychoanalysis. Um, I don't really have time to teach you the four discourses and how they relate to Lacanian theory. There's just no time today, so I kind of take for granted that you already know how these are and how they operate, but I'll just do it very quickly. You have four elements in each equation that are basically clockwise moving around and have a different location in the four different uh, math themes. So if we look at, oh, sorry, I'm on my computer here. Sorry about that. Um, if you look at the, the one on the left, you have four positions. So the top left is, in terms of communication, 
the addresser, the person speaking. On the right, you have the addressee, the person listening, or, or the addressee of the communication. And what interests Lacan is the impossibility of communication. So that goes against a lot of the taken for granted aspects that we associate with language, for example. So Lacan's interested in this notion of the subject of language as the subject of the unconscious and the, 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 the possibility of any kind of uh, transparency in terms of subjectivity and objectivity. And so underneath you have the hidden symptom of the speaker. So it's, the, it's, it's marked by this equation. And on the right, you have what's called the product or the surplus of the, of the structure, also defined as a function of loss. So it, it affects and defines the entire structure. And so there is a um, diagonal relationship between the top left uh, space and the bottom right space. And so in the case of the analyst, the person, the, the A is uh, Lacan's objet petit a. I can't really get into all of the definitions or many sort of ways that the, the term is mobilized, but objet a in this case is a kind of remainder, sort of something that's impossible or undefinable, but that has a kind of uh, negative and positive flux. Uh, so it's, a, it's the only what you could refer to as metaphysical element in the Lacanian, uh, say, set of concepts. So the analyst in this case is object A, and speaking to the dollar sign, which is not a dollar sign, it's actually meant to be a, a diagonal line, and that refers to the, ana, the analysand, the patient in the, in the transferential relationship with the analyst. So the, ana, the split subject is the, is the S with the, the line. Uh, in this case, S2 is knowledge, a series of signifiers, and that, that produces meaning, and therefore knowledge, so that's S2. And S1 is the master signifier. The master signifier being what uh, Freud calls das D, the thing, the sort of uh, the symptom that returns, the eternal return of the symptom in the analysans talking to the analyst. So in the process of transference, what's produced is the symptom. Um, and so the symptom is the product of loss, in the sense that the goal of analysis is to get rid of the symptom, for the symptom to disappear. The analyst is defined by the knowledge of psychoanalysis as a field of knowledge. Um, university discourse is knowledge that's in the position of speech. It's speaking to the student as at. So the, the student in this case is the sort of metaphysical remainder, a kind of nothing in the equation. What's produced is that nothing as a person. So you come out with a diploma. Um, and underscored by the hidden symptom, which is the master signifier. So the discourse university is unaware of power relations. It's almost as if in a didactic relationship, power is ignored and we hope for some kind of exchange of knowledge and information. So you sort of underscore and ignore the question of power, which in the case of the, the, corp, the neoliberal university, let's say in, in the say, uh, early 20th century university, it might have been something like class privilege in terms of university discourse. That's shifted today to capitalization in the university, the neoliberal university where it's privatization that is the hidden symptom. In the case of the master, the master signifier is speaking, speaking to knowledge, which in this particular case is the knowledge of the slave. So what the master wants is to know what the slave knows. So you, you can think about this in terms of a, um, like a king who owns something like, you know, X million peasants. So the king wants to know what the peasants know, which is the quality of the crops that season. And if the, the crops are not doing well, uh, the knowledge of the peasant is useless to the sovereign, and so that sovereign is in a bad position because they either have to, uh, you know, deal with strife, or they have to themselves, in other, in somehow, in some way, encourage strife so that they co they can collect the the wealth that they want to collect. So the master is unaware of their humanity, essentially, as split subjects. They don't know. The master doesn't know 
that the master is not all, to put it that way, that the master is a split subject rather than an absolute. And in the case of the hysteric, the uh, split subject is addressing the master or the master signifier as a hysteric saying, why are you doing this to me? What do you want from me? Why this constant bombardment? Why do you picture me this way? Uh, I don't see myself in your representation. So there's a struggle for recognition taking place, but at the same time, it's hystericized. So I tend to use the discourse of the hysteric to refer to activism and activists' relationship to the state. So activists as subjects of globalization addressing the power of the state and the power of corporations, producing knowledge, knowledge of global warming, knowledge of social inequality, and in some ways being, as a hidden symptom, undermined by their kind of nothingness in that equation. So I use a hysteric to refer to activist practices, the master to refer to what we traditionally define as, as high art practices, or art with a capital A, or autonomous practices, uh, discourse of the university as criticality, uh, the kind of work that's encouraged and taught in universities, in academies, and uh, represented by museums and art institutions, and analysts as the critic, you could say, the function of the critic or the function as the theorist whose goal it is to sort of understand what's happening, what are the symptoms, what are the problems, and what might be a kind of traversal of the fantasy. How do we get away from the fantasy of aesthetics and maybe even um, the avant-garde as, uh, as a structure? So how to dissolve even the avant-garde, let's say, as a symptom? So there is in this avant-garde sense a kind of overcoming of art, dissolution of the field of aesthetics, and dissolution of the field of politics as utopian possibilities. Um, so this is a graph that I've presented many times now in the introductions to my books or in, in chapters of my books, so it will be familiar to some people, where on the left you have anti-art, which is a sort of hysterical discourse of the hysteric activist nomadic practices that I define as in some way petty bourgeois acts of transgression. They're atheistic when it comes to art, when it comes to the, the importance of aesthetics. Um, Anti-anti-art, which would be a kind of communist proletarian art, defined as the discourse of the analyst. So in the, the Communist Party is kind of always monitoring and checking what it is that artists want. And sometimes artists want to do things that, the re that are not propagandistic. And so the regime has to sort of verify, you know, what's happening with Leibach? Are they making fun of us? How is this destabilizing society? And they sort of want in some ways to um, disabuse artists of their antagonistic, maybe hysterical relationship to the regime, insofar as the regime is there in some ways to represent the interests of the people. Anti-anti-art, uh, which would be a kind of discourse of the university, nowadays defined as Tina, uh, Margaret Thatcher's There Is No Alternative, now defined by people in academia as there is no outside. There's no outside to global capitalism, so that the kind of culture we have is not an avant-garde culture that wants to, a system change, but a sort of tinkering within the system as we know it, with the idea that there's, there's no possibility of coming up with a system different from global capitalism. It's, it's a bad system, we don't like it, but it's the best of all possible worlds in a world of disasters. Oh, so the um, uh, criticality of the university is a, a kind of uh, bourgeois, liberal, academic in a sense of scholarly, in a sense of uh, theorized and um, a sort of true believer in the category of art. And so in terms of the rules of art, academics in some ways believe that the rules are known. And so I, I, they are what I refer to as morons, people who believe that there are rules and that you can play by the rules and win by those rules. Um, I'm going to make a quick gloss on this. The idea of the avant-garde was first conceived. Time? No, no, I'm saying the Oh, sorry about that. Um, it was first conceived as a festival 
in part because Montreal has a number of festivals as part of its sort of creative cities programming that are artistically, culturally, politically somewhat mundane and tourism oriented, not very radical or interesting in my opinion. And uh, I wanted to create a kind of anti-festival, a festival that in its, in its um, form and in its kinds of practices would be somehow challenging the kind of creative industries, creative cities programming that is happening. It's very commercialized. Um, and so that was difficult to imagine. It was easier for me to imagine editing a book as a starting point and then possibly afterwards having a festival that would have the book as a sort of ballast that I could present to people and, and have in, t in terms of organizing. So everything we've done with Neem is exactly what I had hoped for in terms of a fantasy of organizing a festival. So I thank Neem, Yanis, and where's Helene? And Helene uh, for, for what we've done here. Um, in Montreal, as I discussed the, the project after the book was published, there were two events that in some ways hijacked the, the idea of the avant-garde as a festival. The one on the left was organized by Howe, which is an arts collective. And you could say these are artists who are kind of, um, these are artists who are anti-art artists. They're sort of nomadic artists who are associated with social movement actors and activists. And they didn't want to collaborate with the big museums, the big institutions and sponsors, and they're fighting gentrification in a particular part of the city. And they dedicate uh, the, the uh, festival to various causes. Um, so they are addressing political issues through a festival which they refer to as a celebration of the avant-garde. And so I had discussed my project with uh, a member of this collective. And as far as I know, they hijacked the idea because before you knew it, a few months later, they were planning uh, this festival. It doesn't matter whether they did or not, but it just turned out that way. So the idea of the avant-garde exists in many forms. And so that was one form that you could say it existed. The other one was the Montreal Biennale of 2014-15, which was the first Montreal Biennale after it had been re-established. For a while it had disappeared, there was a version of it, and then it had been sort of reorganized. And so the first um, edition of the Montreal Biennale ha included a number of avant-garde artists that we, or artists we would associate with avant-gardism like Hedo Steril, Thomas Hirshhorn, Bifo Berardi was invited to what they referred to as an anti-conference. So I had been talking about an anti-festival. They organized an anti-conference. And they also had the Charles Gaines manifestos, which are in the book, volume one, and which you can see downstairs. They had those pieces in the exhibition. So that was kind of a plus for me because I got to see them for the first time at, as uh, the original works. Um, <clears throat> the funny thing about the Biennale is that it began with this kind of political orientation. The next Biennale, two years later, was dedicated not to the avant-garde or critical practices, but to hedonism. Um, and so they kind of completely changed their theme, you could say. And so it made you question the, the way that the organizers were or were not dedicated to what they presented the first time around. Whereas the Howell Art Collective, you could be sure that festival after festival, they will be basically on, on message in terms of their practice. Um, so I compared that to uh, a scene in uh, David Lynch's Mulholland Drive where Rebecca Del Rio is singing Roy Orbison's Crying and at one point she collapses but the song carries on. Um, and so the, the idea of the avant-garde kind of like the song Crying in this film carries on uh, as the, in terms of how it's uh, marked by these instances. I later added um, the discourse of the master to what I showed previously as, as discourse of the, of the hysteric analyst and university. So I added this category, art, in terms of discourse of the master, and also Lacan's discourse of the capitalist, uh, which he discusses in a different book um, a few years later than the other side of uh, psychoanalysis. And here, the voice of the avant-garde, of course, 
is also used by Mercedes-Benz. They, they, they named one of their cars the avant-garde. And so we have it here in terms of the discourse of the capitalist. And also um, a website called Artsy began a series called the Artsy Avant-Garde, which is sponsored by Dior Fashion House. And they present annually every year 50 new avant-garde artists that they define as avant-garde, which are basically hot, trendy artists that are no nothing like the artists that are discussed in these books. Um, so different ways in which the voice of uh, the avant-garde is expressed in, uh, term, in terms of the sort of new uh, field of cultural production that we have in a world where the petty bourgeois habitus, as defined by Pierre Bourdieu, has now become a dominant hegemonic uh, habitus. So it's no longer, um, I would say, it's no longer art as the discourse of the master that we have as a, a dominant feature today in terms of culture industries. It's rather the discourse of the capitalist that we have as a dominant tendency. And in reaction to it, the petty bourgeois nomadic activist class. So the sort of movement of the movements, the anti-globalization movement, artists, the activists who are responding to the, the economic hegemony of corporations and governments. And so artists have to, avant-garde artists have to ask themselves, what's this idea? Do we have to catch up with the Mercedes-Benz, which I imagine is a well-engineered automobile that can go rather quickly? And so do artists need to catch up with this kind of marketing, uh, dissemination, and capitalization? So there are different ways that uh, the artists can negotiate the space of critique, the space of what we would in a 19th century, early 20th century sense have defined as the historical avant-garde, as anti-capitalist vectors, and the conditions of the global petty bourgeoisie in which activists and scholars are now op are operating or functioning. So in terms of the historical situation, what seems to be possible today more more than other possibilities is the discourse of the capitalist in terms of market value and the discourse of the hysteric in terms of activist reaction to what's created by the emphasis on overproduction and surplus. The alternatives would be something that seems more 19th century, more modernist, you could say, would be art as discourse of the master, autonomous art that in some ways can be conceived of as vanguardist, um, as well as bourgeois art, uh, discourse of the master. So discourse of the avant-garde as analyst and discourse of the master would be something that we would want as a possibility, as a difference from the emphasis on neoliberal globalization, but within a context where that has become more or less hegemonic. So the concept avant-garde appears remaindered or historical in some ways. It has a historical sense. Uh, in this case, in terms of the relationship between these two uh, historical periods, if you want to call it that, you would have, you could position or think of your position in different ways. One would be the avant-garde as a symptom. So the symptom would be S1, the master signifier, the avant-garde as your symptom. This would be someone who's wanting to do something avant-garde in light of the uh, metaphysical insistence on the conditions that actually exist, the actually existing social conditions and ideological frameworks. Um, one would be to say there's no difference so that they would be equivalent, which would be a kind of lure, a kind of illusion uh, represented here as hypnotism. So one is hypnotized by the conditions in one exists, yet nevertheless thinks of oneself as, as avant-garde. And so this is a little bit in a way that the creative industries gurus talk about how they want to stimulate uh, creativity so that we have the next Leonardo or the next uh, Michelangelo or uh, Bill Gates. And so you have here a kind of uh, trance relationship.
The other is fantasy. I've written about fantasy in terms of over-identification practices. So in, in the over-identification practice, you, you situate yourself within the dominant uh, terms, and then you think of your practice as avant-garde, as outside, ideologically, but um, effectively, practically, inside these uh, conditions. So you over-identify with the worst aspects of today's global hegemony of the petty bourgeoisie. Um, this one would, would be perversion, in which case you would think of avant-garde as in some ways being the dominant conditions. So you kind of ignore the fact that it's not the dominant set of conditions and you simply act as if they are. Um, the broken fantasy is probably, um, in a way, how the two volumes work most effectively. The broken fantasy is, one, you understand the demands for creativity in today's precarious economy, yet you reject them insofar as they're telling you what to do, insofar as they're conditioning your practice, insofar as they're making you miserable and poor and ineffective. So once you come to that realization, you have separation. So the top, uh, the top half is an arrow going that way, and the bottom half is an arrow going in the other way, defined by Lacan as demand and separation. <clears throat> the fantasy of avant-gardism in the sense of creating something new, creating something never seen before, or even as a, a new social movement that would create a brave new world. What is in the future that's in advance of the global petty bourgeois neoliberal industries, creative industries, we don't know. And so it takes the form of something like psychosis. Since the, um, the, the Spinozan metaphysical element is completely unknown and completely outside. So it's a wager on, it's like what Derrida would call a shot in the dark. It's a wager on the impossible or the unknown. And in, in that sense, uh, a negation functions in, in some sense in those terms. It's not a transgression of the terms that are known, but it's a negation of the conditions that exist. Um, and so what's, what's the question of fate if we don't know what's on the other side of neoliberal globalization? <clears throat> this was the, the question confronted by Lenin during the Russian Revolution, which was, the question what is to be done, how, do, how, do, how can the revolution be secured and uh, saved in a context in which the tendency was to, to introduce instead social democracy. So Lenin's answer to the unknown was the Bolshevik party. In terms of anything uh, like this, we don't know if the Bolshevik party would be the solution to our situation. It seems as though uh, a return to the Communist Party is something that Lenin uh, introduced as, as a necessity in that context, but may not be uh, a necessity for us. Um, this gets into Lacan's graph of desire, um, which I'm working with now as a, a, a new way to think about what I've been thinking about already. I won't go into too much detail on it, uh, but on the left hand side you have the arc of intention and the arc of the signifier. So when we speak, we talk and we think as though we're moving forward. But in Lacan, what's actually happening is something retroactive. So if I say, for example, you're, you as an audience, you're very interesting, it's almost as though you're thinking, I will be, in, in, a, in a sense, you're thinking I'm going to be interesting or in the future I might be interesting, but really what's happening is you will have been interesting or you were interesting insofar as language is functioning. Uh, so there's a retroactivity of, of meaning in the arc of intention that seems contradictory to the arc of signification where you have signifier and meaning. And so what Lacan is interested in is how meaning is not on the, in the future, meaning is in the past. Um, in terms of the, 
these are like Hadean concepts. This is the subject now on the on the side of intention. The subject, the sort of autotelic subject, or the the uh, Descartesian cogito, is here is a split subject, a subject of language. So we understood now that the subject is a subject of language. From there, we can move simply to this location. This is my ideal ego. This is how I would like to be. And I can't be that. I could never be that. If I was that, I would be something like a, uh, a young infant before the stage of the acquisition of language. You'd be polymorphously perverse, in a sense, if you simply were what you thought you wanted to be, which would be completely disorganized, as what uh, Lacan calls the trot bébé, the sort of crawling baby. And so this is a little bit what Badiou refers to animality. You're sort of like a crawling baby, and you have, you're kind of disorganized, or even body, body without organs, in Deleuze and Guattari's sense. So you haven't been uh, yet incorporated into the other, the Oedipal relationship. So the ego seeks to move immediately with their sense of self into society over here. So this is the, the big other and the, the I, which would be the ego ideal. This is kind of how I want to be in the world. And I'd like to be able to skip the world so that I could just be myself. Sort of just do it or just be, just, I've seen slogans around here. One is check your ego at the door. And the other one was to just be yourself, something like this. Uh, so check your ego out the door would be almost like as if I, I, I could move here to here without with no remainder. The other exists here as voice, which I've talked about in terms of the idea of the avant-garde. And this would be something like a Foucauldian um, playpen, where you have a series of, of pleasures beyond, um, beyond the reality principle or the carceral, the, in the sense that Foucault defines the carceral where things are somewhat more sinister in terms of discursive power. It's inherently meaningless. So the realm of the other is unknown. So the big other, like your father, or like in the sense that Freud says, God is dad, rather than Nietzsche's God is dead. We would have here, in a sense, if God was not dad, God would simply be dead, and we can just enjoy or not enjoy as things go. But unfortunately, the graph crosses over into the realm of the signifier. So we always ask ourselves, why this, why not that? Why meaning, um, which um, Lacan refers to as the chevoie. So we always ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Who are we doing it for? What is demanded of us? And so it passes into fantasy, into avant-garde fantasy. And then in the complete graph, it passes through the voice, which is a kind of castration. I'm not going to go into too much details in terms of this graph, but this refers to desire, which is the desire of the other, which is, in a sense, our unconscious is, never belongs to us. Our unconscious belongs to the world outside of us. So Lacan is interested in knowing how we interact, dovetail, but never dovetail with our environment. So Lacanian psychoanalysis is not about a normal subject or a well-adapted subject, which for Lacan is an impossibility. Alienation and paranoia are fundamental to, to subjectivity. So it goes through jouissance, which means that you can never in some ways completely enjoy your set of social constraints. Um, moving into the realm of the signifier, I can then come to the, uh, the ego ideal, which is more or less my situation. Um, there's a good expression of it I wrote down. The retroactive character of meaning as f a function of the big other. And so we come to a kind of symbolic identification. And so I've taken these terms and I'm working it through in terms of the function of the avant-garde in today's, or the idea of the avant-garde in today's situation. So I, I will in future writing be working through these, uh, this structure in terms of a temporality of the avant-garde. This is a, uh, a graph from Frederick Jameson's. He didn't invent it. it the invent the uh, source is Ihab Hassan. It's presented in um, postmodernism or the, the cultural logic of late capitalism. I don't know if 
if you can read these um, lists. I used to present this as a handout to my students when I was teaching visual culture. So this is a sort of, for me, a kind of introductory handout. On the right hand side, you would have, in a way, the result of all the complicated postmodern and post-structural theory that we're familiar with from, for example, French theory, Bart, Derrida, Kristeva, Irigaray, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so these are often contrasted to what are taken to be absolutes. So we were, uh, Eleftheria, we were talking about, what was it logic and paralogic? Um, so logic would be on the left-hand side, and paralogic would be on the right-hand side. So you have, in a way, sort of like the logos in, um, Der in Derrida and the supplement. Uh, or in the case of um, Roland Barthes, you would have something like the signifier and then infinite semiosis. Um, so you have basically a kind of hypostatized fixity. You, you need the, f the, f the fixity of the hypostatized concept, the logos, so that you could have the supplement. So it's kind of like uh, the clashes, police and thieves. They're, they sort of are interdependent and they sort of depend on one another. And what I used to say in a somewhat cynical, cynical way to my students, if you want to make it in the art world today, just do this. Do what's on the right-hand side. Do what is in terms of deterritorialization, de what capitalism expects of you. What's more difficult in a postmodern context is to propose a stable ethical position. And semiotics doesn't offer ethics as a, a, ma a way of being. It offers irony. It, it offers continuous destabilization. As in some ways a politics, as in some ways ostensibly an anti-fascism. In, insofar as ethics is anything stable is considered totalitarian, so this was postmodern theory as it as it came to define itself as the alternative to dialectical materialism, which had become orthodoxy in communist countries, and so part of the reason why a French theory and well, there are other methods, of course, but especially postmodern and poststructural theory developed. So what we refer to as the generation of pessimistic scholars. That would include uh, Foucault. Um, uh, I mean, this is, of course, debatable. Uh, but the pessimistic scholars that are very, uh, Baudrillard especially, uh, very skeptical of any kind of modernist utopia. Um, so this is a, a, a work by William Pauhida which is using a kind of network model to think about the different institutions that an artist would negotiate so that they could make it in the quote-unquote art game. Um, I'm going to skip this graph, but in a way it sort of suggests, based on this exhibition at MoMA, that if one is networked effectively, that would be one way to succeed in the art game. So. Uh, networking is a kind of deterritorialization, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, something like authorship. Uh, you're supposed to be networked rather than autonomous. Uh, and, and this is to be reflected in the form of work that you make. So for example, activist artists are not interested in producing objects that have a signature. They're more interested in networks and outcomes in terms of social effects. Um, this is uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu's um, description of the field of cultural production um, contrasted with Komar and Melamed's The People's Choice. And so it tries to define in some ways the, the, the place of the avant-garde in the social field, at least at it as it would have existed in France in the 1970s. So this is, in a way, a model that I consider to be outmoded insofar as I argue the petty bourgeois habitus has replaced the bourgeois habitus, which included the avant-garde. Um, and so what Komar and Melamed did is they, they used polls and statistics to find out what people's tastes and preferences were in culture, and they discovered that people dislike what you see on the top, which is avant-garde art that looks a little bit like Soviet constructivism or suprematism, and what they like are landscapes with statues of George Washington, children and deer, and especially the color blue. Uh, 
And so according to statistics and polls, these are the, these are the petty bourgeois, you could say, preferences and tastes of people in today's universe of culture. Um, definable in terms of this uh, sketch. I'm not really sure why the social space is national, but it's because Bourdieu limited his uh, studies to the French context. The space field of power has to do with economic power, primarily. Um, and then you have different categories like economic capital, CE, and cultural capital. So the different forms of capital, and also symbolic capital. So the avant-garde have a high degree of symbolic capital, and as you see on the left, a small degree of economic capital, and a high degree of cultural capital. Sorry about the PowerPoint thing. I mean, it's mostly for myself that I'm doing this. Um, Vaudeville, in contrast, would have a low degree of cultural capital and a higher degree of economic capital, insofar as we're talking about popular art. So like a blockbuster film uh, has a connection to this kind of economic um, interest. And so it will underplay anything that is too highly refined in terms of cultural capital, too difficult to understand, and so on. The problem with this graph it does, is that it doesn't make space for communist art. There's no category here that includes political capital in this analysis. Um, I give as an example um, Godard's Film Socialiste, which I define as, in terms of discourse of the analyst, an example of communist art today. And to show you a little bit how the the field of culture functions today. I mentioned this film that came out recently by Michel Hazanavikius, which was about uh, avant, um, Godard in the 60s, uh, his experience around the time he was making La Chinoise and his involvement with the students during May 68. And I, def I defined the work a little bit as a takedown film. And insofar as Godard is one of the most significant avant-garde filmmakers today, you have the field of culture which has kind of uh, difficulty with this figure. And so um, in an interview, the filmmaker said something that God, uh, Godard is not God. We can laugh at Godard, we can make fun of Godard. And so the question that is asked, or th what begs the question is, why is, why is it, that it that it's necessary to say Godard is not God? In other words, if there is no big other of the political aesthetic, why do you need a figure that you could then make fun of and uh, banalize through a mediocre film? And um, in a quote, Godard said that the movie that was proposed by this filmmaker is a stupid, stupid idea. And so the filmmaker, a la avant-garde, which defines itself as the critics uh, define it, the filmmaker took Godard's quote and used it in an advertisement. So we have these kinds of avant-garde strategies in the sense that you know you had Courbet with the Salon des Refusés or the Impressionists who named themselves Impressionists as a, in a derisive, self-derisive sense. We have it flipped. The culture industries and the creative industries are, are flipping the script, making fun of, of avant-garde artists. And so there's a sort of impossibility of its, its very presence. It kind of comes around to what um, Adorno said, which was the, the possibility of art existing today in um, aesthetic theory. So the same logic can be extended. The, the, the possibility of anything avant-garde existing today is in question. Um, and I'll just finish with this as an example. In a neoliberal context, how is it possible that and a place like the Glasgow School of Art and the Macintosh building could be neglected to the extent that there would be a fire in the library and in, in the building. This is Glasgow's, uh, you could say, its most prized um, architectural space in the city. People go to Glasgow to see this building and it doesn't have a sprinkler system. And this is in the last few years with neoliberalization and with budget cuts um, somehow this can't be managed. And it's a good expression of basically what's happening to the earth in terms of global warming. It's something very similar that's happening. 
And so this, for me, would be kind of definitional of today's global petty bourgeoisie, post-enlightenment schizocynicism. Um, same goes for the Brazil National Museum in Rio de Janeiro, which had been closed recently because of budget cuts. Somehow the, the national treasure of the country can't be protected with 20 million artifacts, uh, or is it 200 million? Tw some 20 million artifacts destroyed in the fire just recently. Um, so I'll, I'll just finish on that note um, and pass the floor over to Evanthia. And just as, a, as an intro, I'll mention um, Evanthia is a visual arts researcher, visual arts producer, and arts educator. She's assistant professor and program coordinator of the fine arts program at the University of Nicosia. Her practice-led research is focused on the role of conflict resolution in relation to socially engaged art practices. And her talk today will address the ways in which artistic practices have been used in the context of the ethno-nationally divided city of Nicosia, and this as a tool for conflict, transformation, and dialogue. 